welcome to all of you. Uh, this is my hometown now for only about six months, I guess. Uh, but I too regard it as Charm City, and I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to welcome all of you to Baltimore. In particular, I'm happy to welcome you to our school, the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, because this is the home of research in the field that matters most to you. And it's a home that's undergoing a tremendous amount of transition and revolution and building now, thanks to the very strong efforts of Beverly Wendland, the chair of the department, and her colleagues who are dedicated not only to the first class research, but to rethinking the entire pathway by which we create new scientists. This is a university that is uh, justly famous for its medical school, uh, and the students who, who head in that direction pass through the laboratories and to, through research programs of our science faculty. But first and foremost, we're interested in developing new scientists. And they don't get to where you are unless they've passed through really amazing hands, both as researchers and as teachers who stimulate an interest in the basics of discovery. The pathway by which that happens is changing, and I, no one has learned more about that than I have since I arrived here. The traditional methods of exposing students to large lecture classes in which they learn more or less by rote what it is they need to know to develop a research background is starting to give way to a more interactive, problem-solving, research-based form of education at the undergraduate level. Uh, here at Johns Hopkins, we're going to express that through the development of a new laboratory building, which for us is a physical statement of a philosophical change in science education. We are looking to our students to develop a more interdisciplinary science background, to develop uh, more of a research orientation and group orientation in the work that they do with one another. We are seeing an evolution uh, toward the kind of creativity that you use every day in your laboratories, starting with the very youngest people we can get our hands on. And I think that is uh, the middle of a kind of revolution for the country as a whole. Uh, Johns Hopkins is not the first, and it certainly won't be the last, to take a hard look at science education and try to think through what we really need to have the kind of creative scientific labor force of the future. And I don't think there has ever been a time when that mattered more, both for the productivity of the country as a whole and for the kinds of um, problems that, befit, that, that confront the normal, ordinary citizen. Um, one need only look at the headlines from very just this morning's newspaper. We've got an E. coli epidemic breaking out in Europe. We've got the Russians closing their gates to food produced in Western Europe as a result of a terrible problem that only the people in this room can, can come to understand. Um, we've got a food supply around the world that needs to be protected. We've got problems of infectious disease, which uh, the people in this room are going to help to solve. These are problems that affect not only the health and well-being of the people of the world, but even the sort of civil relations that obtain between states. So even the sort of stable civil societies that we depend upon as citizens of an international world come down in the end to the kind of work that you do. And that may not be the way you think about it when you're in the laboratory, but it's the way the rest of us who are not scientists think about the value of what you do. But not, we're not going to be able to crack those problems as scientists unless the next generations coming up through your laboratories are educated in the kinds of techniques and problem solving and innovative ways of thinking that move way beyond the kind of rote learning that was so common when I was an undergraduate student. So I want to commend you not only for the scientific work that you do, but for spending your time thinking about how to educate the next generation. That is really a sacred trust. And it's something that all of us are depending on you for. And I hope that these next few days will be an opportunity for you to review best practices and think about what you can learn from one another. Um, I really think it's remarkable that you have such a large group, the largest ever, assembled here for this very purpose, to think about science education. Because we all know that the professional rewards tend to go primarily to the research lab and your accomplishments therein. Uh, so that we can't say that you're sitting here because you're going to reap some enormous outsized reputational benefit for spending the next few days thinking solely about how to improve the education of the next generation or two of undergraduates. You're here because this really is a sacred trust, because the country's depending on you, because we in the university leadership depend on you. We certainly can't do it by ourselves. Uh, all we can do is help to cheerlead from the sidelines. But it's a very important sideline indeed. So I want to thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy your stay here at Johns Hopkins. 
we will be looking to learn from you how all the many ways in which we can apply your insights to the revolutions in our own curriculum. And uh, you couldn't be in better hands than the local organizing committee uh, full of my very distinguished scientists. So thank you and welcome to Johns Hopkins.